Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel for part 3 of our Pimax review series, coming up on today's episode of 2020 Flight Simmers! Welcome back! Today's episode is going to be a little bit different than part 1 and part 2. Today I'm going to be giving some of my personal thoughts and solutions to problems that I've run into throughout the course of me testing out the Pimax Crystal. Now I do have one disclaimer today, and that is Pimax did send me this headset for review, but that is not going to sway anything that I'm going to show you or any of my opinions throughout this series. If and when you decide to purchase a Pimax Crystal, in the description I do have an affiliate link there. It really means a lot to me if you use that link. It doesn't cost anything extra to you, but it does give us a little commission to help keep the channel going. This just in, from now until October 30th, receive up to $199 in accessories for your Pimax Crystal. During checkout, make sure to use the discount code below in the description, and also make sure to comment which item you would like to receive between the DMAS speakers, the Lighthouse faceplate, or the new optic cable. Hurry before time runs out! In today's video, I have a lot to go over, so please take advantage of the chapter section down below. Now, there is one thing that I really messed up one when I did part two of this series and that is I assume that everybody that owns this headset is going to only use it for Microsoft Flight Simulator. So there's a couple other applications that I didn't go over in part two. We're going to go over those today later on in this episode. So now let's go over today's video and how it's going to be laid out. We're first going to go over a couple of issues that I've had with the Pimax Crystal. We're also going to go over a couple of solutions that I've had for those issues. We're next going to talk about some comfort solutions that I've come up with. One's a DIY solution and another one can be purchased. We're also going to go over the 72 Hertz feature that they just implemented in the firmware. We're then going to go over a couple of the applications that I missed in episode number two for all the software setup. Now these applications that we're going to go over here do not pertain to Microsoft Flight Simulator. But if you're a DCS fan or Pavlov, then you definitely want to listen up when it comes to these applications. Once we're through with those applications, I will then go over all of my settings for the Pimax Crystal. All of my PC specs are going to be down below in the description for comparison. So just so you have an idea of what I'm working with. Once we're finished up with the Pi tool settings, we will then go to my OpenXR toolkit and I will go over everything in there with you as well. As a bonus, at the very end of this video, I want to go over an issue that a lot of people have been having when you're using the extreme local dimming. The issue that people are having is when it's a pitch black area and you have, say, your gauges that are lit up in front of you, you are going to get a tremendous amount of blooming when you're using the extreme local dimming. So I've got a solution for that to help mitigate that issue, but you want to stay tuned until the end of the video for that. Now, if you have any comments or questions along the way today, please post those down below in the comments section and I'll get right back to you. And if you enjoy today's content, make sure to hit that subscribe, tick on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button. It is greatly appreciated. Alright, so a couple things that I want to go over first are some of the issues that I've run into with the Pimax Crystal. Now, the first issue that I've run into is when I'm loading the Pimax and starting the software on my PC, I get a little pop-up that says your Pimax Crystal is not charging, unplug and plug things back in to try to get it to work. Now sometimes when I unplug the hub and plug it back in or the USBs that go into the hub, sometimes it will work and then others it doesn't. So I guess that means it's not charging when I'm using this during gameplay. And the second thing that I've had issues with on this headset and this is just recently, and this was also before the new updated firmware, so I know it's not a firmware thing. And that is I'm getting flickering in the headset. Now, the only way that I can describe this to you is, well, looking in a VR headset, it almost looks like you're looking at an IMAX theater screen. So imagine you got this huge screen out in front of you. What I'm noticing is, like, little 19-inch... TV monitors would pop up here and there and it would be full of static. Now when they would flicker, I mean it would really only stay up for about half a second or less. 
And yesterday I was doing a flight and it got so bad, I had to unplug the headset and plug it back in. I think I'm able to solve the issue when it does happen. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So as you'll notice on the side of the headset, we have this uh, HDMI DisplayPort adapter that's going to be in between your main cable and the headset. So what I did was I completely disconnected this. I don't know if you can see that. But I completely disconnected this from the headset. I had to pull the face shield or face gasket off a little bit to get the display cable in there. And I did that to try to solve that issue. Now, when I first did that, all the flickering went away. So I'm thinking, great, we're, we're solved, fixed, good. Uh-uh. Next time I load it in, started getting flickering again. And it actually got progressively worse and worse and worse as the flight got on. So what I did was I took myself out of VR. And then while everything was still running, I just disconnected the DisplayPort cable from the headset and then plugged it back in again, and then all the flickering went away. So in my opinion, I think there's got to be something wrong with either the cable itself or the actual connection on the headset. So the, those are the two issues that I've been dealing with recently for the Pimax Crystal. Um, if you guys have any other issues that I haven't mentioned here, please let me know those down below in the comments section. So the next thing that I want to go over are a couple things that I did to help improve the comfort of the Pimax Crystal. Now don't get me wrong here, it still feels like I'm wearing a helmet on my head because of the weight, but it makes it a little more bearable when you're flying those three hour sessions. So the first thing that I did, and this can be purchased, is to get the top head strap. This is the Apache head strap. I'll post a link down below in the description. I also have a picture here so you can see what exactly it is. For those of you who are having issues with the top strap and it just feeling like it's real weighted down, this Apache strap really makes a big difference. And one thing that I can add to that, it, it really eases up the pressure of the entire face gasket pressing against your face. It takes a lot of load off of your face and Especially for my face, I've kind of got an egg-shaped head. <laughs> so when I put that on, I really feel that headset pulling down all the skin around my eyes. And that affects your vision. So by having this on top, it really makes it much more comfortable. So now I want to show you the DIY solution that I have for the face gasket. And this is because Pimax doesn't offer any other face gaskets yet for people with smaller heads or misshaped heads like mine. Here's a solution I came up with for the front facial gasket. Now, if you don't know my head dimensions, I did post all that in episode number one, and I showed you exactly how I measured my head, so you can kind of gauge that and do the same thing to yourself and see how it would possibly fit for you. But here's what I did. So I went over to the local Home Depot. I got some weather stripping. And here it is. I got two different kinds. I got this one and I got this one. They're both three quarter inch wide, but this is only three eighths inch thick and this is half inch thick. I wound up going with the three eighths and that seemed to work best for me. The reason why I had to do this was because I had a lot of space on the sides of the gasket, but I had a ton of pressure right in the very center of my head. Now, if you look at the facial interface, you're gonna see kind of a flat spot right here in the very front. So what I did was I took the weather stripping and from right where it starts to curve, I went from there and then all the way down the side past the indent for where your glasses would go through. And I did that on both sides all the way down and left the very center of that flat part there because that's what was hitting my head. So I didn't need to take up any space there. And then all I did was just fill in all the extra area. I cut some to fit. And uh, that's been the best solution that I've had so far for the headset. And it makes it very comfortable now uh, when I'm using it for those longer sessions. So just a tip, if anybody else has issues with comfort, those are the two things that I could recommend for the headset. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is that new 72 Hertz feature in the Pi Tool software. Now, this is supposed to be for flight simmers to help with frame rate and help with performance inside the headset. 
I have tested all of the selections that we have available, 72, 90, and 120. Now I tested 90 and 120 before the new update that I just did yesterday. And when I was testing between the two, I did not notice any noticeable difference in frame rate, performance, or anything. And in my experience, upping that to 120 should have decreased our performance a little, but it didn't. So I'm just wondering what's going on there between that 90 and 120. If you know, let me know down below in the comments because I'm stupid when it comes to this stuff. The 72 Hertz feature is a little bit different. Now, when I did the update yesterday, it did say that it was an alpha release of the software. And now if you want to use the 120 Hertz feature, you might get black screens or flickering or something like that. So... I don't understand why they released an alpha firmware Pimax and now you added 72 hertz but took away people's ability to use the 120 hertz feature. So I don't know I don't know why anybody would do that um to their headset, you know, get it working right and then release it, but Anyway, that's what we have to work with, so let me explain to you what happens when you use the 72 hertz feature. Um, it almost looks like you're looking at a strobe light, and that's only going to really be when you're looking at the sky. So if I'm not looking at the sky, everything seems to be okay, but as soon as I look up at the sky, it's just strobing so bad. It's, it's, if anybody has had experience with the HP Reverb G2 or G1, and you use the 60 hertz feature that they have with that, I believe it's 60 hertz, and you will see the exact same thing, um, or at least most people have seen the exact same thing, is that strobing effect that you get, and that really messes with you. Now, again, that might only be system-specific because I have heard other people say that they didn't notice that in that headset. I can't comment on that. I can only tell you my experience that I have. So, <clears throat> 72 hertz. Do I recommend it? Nope, not at all. Go to 90 hertz because I guess now you can't use 120 because uh, it's going to black screen on you. So don't try that. Uh, just keep using 90 hertz. And maybe sometime here in the near future, we'll get another update and maybe we'll get into a beta firmware so we won't have so many glitches. All right, so now with that out of the way, I want to get into some of the applications that I missed in part two, and then we'll get into all of my settings. So let's hop over to PC and we'll go over all of those right now. All right, so before we start here, just keep in mind that all of the links for all of the websites will be down below in the description, so check that out. First thing that we're going to go over is Open Composite for the OpenXR Toolkit. Now, what is Open Composite? The goal of Open Composite is to run applications built on the legacy Open VR. It's the predecessor to the OpenXR platform, which typically requires Steam VR to use the OpenXR instead. The diagram that you're going to see here below shows how games developed for OpenXR and Open VR typically operate. The diagram down here below will show you how Open Composite enables applications built for Open VR to bypass Steam VR and take advantage of the OpenXR and OpenXR toolkit. So now what headsets are compatible with Open Composite? If we scroll down a little bit, you will see the headset compatibility for pretty much all of the mainstream headsets that are out there. Now, in this list, it will tell us if it has native OpenXR support and if it allows the use of OpenXR. All the way on the very end, this is the installation method, and you will see that the install for Open Composite can be different between the different headsets. So make sure that you choose the correct installation method for your headset. So now you might ask, why do I need the Open Composite application? Well, first, you have to know the goal of the OpenXR Toolkit, and that's to add functionality to OpenXR applications. However, not all the applications are written for OpenXR. So therefore, the OpenXR Toolkit cannot be used with those applications unless they use a broker application like Open Composite to help link these apps together. So think of it that way. It's the middleman 
to help you be able to use the OpenXR toolkit on non-OpenXR applications. So now, what are some of the non-OpenXR applications? If we scroll down even further, you will see the game compatibility below. Now there is a bunch of games here in simulators that Open Composite is used for, and you can check the different columns here to see what you need and what is available for each simulator or game. Now if we scroll down even further on this page, it will give us some step-by-step -step guides on how to use Open Composite. We also have an alternative install method, so you can do this by game, or you can do this system-wide. Also, if you would like some more information about Open Composite, if you click on the link here above, it will take you to a GitHub page, and where this will also go over some game compatibility, downloading and installation instructions, and per game installation as well. I'm not going to go over how to download and install all this and set it up because I don't use anything other than Microsoft Flight Simulator. But if you follow all the instructions here, I feel that they've given us sufficient information to get everything running on your system. The next application that I want to go over is in the Pimax XR Runtime application. If we go all the way down to the center of the application, you will see Enable Quad View Rendering with supported applications. Ah, so what is Quad View Rendering? Quad View Rendering is sometimes referred to as Multi Projection or Dynamic Projection, is a rendering technique that an application may use to implement foveated rendering. Typical with stereo rendering, the application will draw two views one from the perspective of the left eye and one from the perspective of the right eye. With the typical stereo rendering, the application will render each eye at full resolution for the entire screen or whichever render scale you're using. Now with quad view rendering, the application draws two views, the outer view or peripheral view with the full field of view and two additional views inner views and foveated views or focus views with a smaller FOV typically centered around where the eyes are looking in the scene. The resolution of each set of views can be set differently, typically a higher resolution for the inner views. So now instead of only having two views in our headset and then rendering each of those views with different circular patterns to help with foveated rendering, this is now going to render four views. So that's why they call it quad view rendering. So now why would we want to use quad views over your regular foveated rendering? For those that have used the quad views over the regular foveated rendering have gotten significant performance improvement from the typical foveated rendering. Problem here is an application needs to be developed specifically for quad views rendering it is not a style of programming that your platform, say Oculus or Pimax, can simply force into the application. So in saying that, I've also got a link here for Microsoft Flight Simulator. And if we take a look at that, unfortunately, we cannot use the quad views in Microsoft Flight Simulator. But we do have the ability to use quad views in DCS World as well as Pavlov VR. So now, is your headset compatible with quad views? Also down below, I will have a link to this web page and it will give you all of the VR headsets that are compatible using the Quad Views companion. Again, I am not going to go over how to download Quad Views or use the application, but I just want everybody to see this that it is available, especially for those of you who are flying in DCS. So I highly recommend this for DCS. I haven't personally tried it, but from what I hear, it is phenomenal. Now the last application that I want to go over here is the Quad View Companion application. So after you download the Quad Views app and install it, you need to make sure that you go to your Pimax XR Runtime tool and click the Enable Quad Views Rendering. The problem here is we have no control over any of the settings in the Quad View application. So to be able to adjust all the various settings, you need to download the Quad View Companion app. You will see here all the various things that can be adjusted in this. Again, I'm not going to go over any of these because it is not compatible with Microsoft Flight Simulator. Thus, I have no use for it.
All right, so now let's get into the meat and potatoes of this episode, and that is all of my settings for the Pimax Crystal. So let's start off in the device menu. Again, I went over the refresh rate earlier. I'm using 90 hertz. I do not check auto IPD adjust, as I found that it does not adjust my IPD correctly. I also have the wearing indicator reminder. So this way, when you put on the headset, it'll tell you whether you need to pull it down or put it up. If you don't want that indicator popping up, here's where you can turn that off. Also make sure that you do an eye calibration once you set your IPD. Go through the calibration so that it knows all the positioning of your eyes for when you're using the wearing location reminder or if you're going to use the auto IPD adjustment. The next menu down on the left is the games menu. And here I set everything to be under the common settings. I don't really set any specific settings. Below here is the render quality, and I keep the render quality on 1, and I adjust all of my resolution in the OpenXR toolkit inside of Microsoft Flight Simulator. I'll get into that in a little while. Below that is the dynamic foveated rendering. If you're going to be using the OpenXR toolkit for your foveated rendering, then you want to make sure that you keep the dynamic foveated rendering off in the Pimax tool. This way you're not double foveating rendering your screen. Below that is smart smoothing, and as of right now, I don't think that's working very well, so I just keep that off. And then hidden area mask, I definitely keep that checked. And what this will do is to mask out any of the hidden areas that you're not going to be able to see in your headset and that'll help improve your performance. And all the settings below these are pretty much default. I haven't changed anything. The next menu down on the left is our general tab. Here we can update our firmware, turn on and off the Pimax home screens. Now I did go over this in episode number two. I make sure that I keep all of this home experience in Pimax home off. It helps with the transition time between entering VR and exiting VR. And the very last menu down is the Advanced tab. Here's where we can adjust our local dimming and also set our lens setting. Now one thing you'll notice here is on the local dimming level, you do not see anything checked here. And that's because I have manually went in and set my settings to what I prefer. Again, that is going to be at the very end of this video. So if you want to know how to help mitigate any of the blooming, Make sure you stay till the end, and I will go over how to do that. Okay, so now let's get into my OpenXR Toolkit settings, and we're going to start with the Performance tab first. Starting at the very top, I have the Upscaling method set to CAS. Below that, Sharpening is at 100%. And for Foveated Rendering, I have this set to Custom. You can set this on Preset and use the Quality setting with the Wide Field of View. But I found when I did that, I had a couple artifacting in the headset. Now this didn't add or subtract to any of the FPS increase or decrease. It's pretty much the same if you use the preset, but it has a much better picture quality in my opinion. Starting off with the inner ring size is at 70%, middle ring resolution at half percent, and the outer ring size is 90% with the outer ring resolution to 1 8 Below that, we have vertical for preferred resolution. The horizontal scale is 125, and everything else below is pretty much off. Now, some people have had uh, success with the turbo mode, and like myself, it doesn't do anything when I turn on or off turbo mode. So because it's experimental, I'm just leaving it off. But if you have a different opinion about the turbo mode, please let me know down below in the comments section on your results. The next menu over is the appearance menu. Now, I know this isn't going to have anything to do with performance, but this does enhance the colors inside of your Pimax crystal even more. So you can pause the screen here and try out these settings here. And if you turn on and off post-processing, you will see inside the sim that there is a very, very slight difference but the difference, I feel, makes it a little bit more lifelike. Let me know if you try these settings out below, and uh, let me know what your thoughts are. The very last menu we're going to go over is the Systems menu, 
And here's where we're able to override the resolution of the Pi tool. So you want to make sure that you tick yes for override resolution. And for those of you who are using a 3080 Ti, I would recommend to use 3100 or less. Going over 3100, I found added a little bit more lag to what I talked about in episode number two, which was the sides of my screen kind of stuttering behind when I turn my head. Below that, everything is pretty much stock, so that's it. Those are all my settings. Now, for those of you who are interested in my Microsoft Flight Simulator settings, as well as my NVIDIA Control Panel settings, I'm not going to go over those here because I've gone over those many times already in the past, and I haven't changed any of those. So I'll post a link down below in the description for a video on all of my settings for Microsoft Flight Simulator. And now for everybody who has stuck around for the bonus portion of the video, we're going to get into how to mitigate all of the blooming when you're using extreme local dimming. Let's hop over to the PC. So to get to the file that we're going to need to adjust here, the address I will post at the bottom of the page here. For those of you who have trouble trying to navigate these menus, let me go through and show you real quick. We're going to click on our C drive. That's where I have the Pi tool installed. We're going to then click on Users. I'm going to go up to my username, down to App Data, Local. We're going to head all the way down to Pimax. Double click. And then we're going to double click the runtime. And that's how you're going to get to the folder that we need to be in so that we can adjust the JSON file for our profile. Now the file that we're going to be adjusting is at the very top here and it says profile all the way on the right hand side. You will also see that it says source type JSON file. So now once you have this highlighted, we're going to right click and then we're going to open with your choice of Notepad. I'm going to use Notepad++. So now that we have this open, you'll see there's not much in this particular folder, but I'm only going to recommend that you adjust this one setting and don't adjust anything else in this menu. The setting that we're going to take a look at here is the local dimming black level. This is what is going to adjust your localized dimming inside of the Pi tool. Now when you have this on extreme, then this number that you see here should just be zero. Now what we want to do is to adjust this up just slightly above zero to help mitigate that horrendous blooming issue. So all you need to do is type 0.005 and then we're going to go up to file, hit save, and that's it. Now, you can mess around with this. I've tried 0 0.01, I've tried 0 0.003, I've tried 0 0.002. Anything below 0 0.005, I started seeing that blooming come back. All right, so that's my bonus tip for today. Please let me know your results down below in the comments section. I'll be really happy to hear how that worked out for everyone. If you guys have any comments or questions, make sure to put them down below in the comments section and I'll get right back to you. And if the video helped you out today, make sure to hit that subscribe, tick on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button. To all my flight simmer friends around the world, keep the blue side up, and we will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you would like to see part four of the series, click up here if it's available. Thanks for watching.